Hey guys, so today I want to talk about zoos from a uh, from an animal welfare perspective. I've been asked about this a lot and it's it's a complex issue, I guess like many issues, but uh, I think it's important to talk about. I think I've talked about it briefly in a couple of videos, but I figured I'd do a whole video about it. So the first thing, um, use is not always abuse. I don't agree with uh, some vegans who think that if you are using an animal that it is automatically wrong and i don't think that's the case use is not necessarily uh, exploitative i think we can envision a lot of scenarios like having a dog for instance you know making a, an animal a loving member of your family taking care of that animal giving it what it needs um, i think that's overall a, a good thing for the animal and i think it could be um, the same situation uh, with a zoo again could be. I think we can envision a scenario where an animal is having all of its needs met and being taken care of and it also has the uh, predation risk removed if it is like a, a prey animal, right? It doesn't have to worry about being eaten alive or uh, getting some sort of infectious disease and just slowly dying or slowly starving. Um, I think we can envision a scenario where it could be an overall good thing for the animal. Even if they are being used for entertainment, right? Even if they are being kept in a facility and people are coming and paying money to look at them, I think we can envision a scenario where this can still be overall good for the animal, again, assuming that all of their needs are met. And admittedly, that is a very big assumption and one that we should not actually make. We should not just assume that zoos, even you know, top tier zoos, zoos that are, what is it, accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, we should not just assume that these zoos are doing everything that they should be doing to care for the animals, that the animals are actually receiving what they need because these are businesses, they do want to make money. It's not cynical to understand that there is a pretty high chance that they are going to be um, cutting quarters at least to some degree when it comes to the animals. I think we've all experienced going to zoos, even really nice zoos. I've been to the Memphis Zoo countless times, which is one of the top zoos in the country. And I've been there and looked at animals and thought this just looks terrible. The cheetah exhibit where they have barely any room, they can never reach a full sprint like you've probably seen cheetahs do, you know, on TV. There's no way they can ever do that. There's just simply not enough room and they're constantly just pacing back and forth. The hippo exhibit had been the same, I believe, since the zoo was founded, which was like forever ago. And it was the saddest thing. I'll try to find a good picture of it, but it was just basically this tiny pool and it could walk and then go into this small enclosure and then come back out and go back in the pool. And that was it. And here's the new exhibit that was opened uh, last year, spring of 2016, which looks awesome at first glance until you realize that it's housing like a lot of different animals. So on the, the left there, uh, the upper left, you can see that's the crocodile exhibit. And then south of there, you have the avi avi aviary. I got it. <laughs> and to the right of that, you have the flamingos and the primates. And then down at the bottom, you have the uh, okapi. And then up towards the top, you have the hippo exhibit, the upper hippo exhibit and the lower hippo exhibit. So it's uh, not that large relative to the entire space. I believe the entire um, size is uh, four acres. And here are some photos that I found and some footage as well. Uh, as you can tell, a lot more space than they used to have. There are three hippos, I believe, uh, right now in the space. And I mean, yeah, it's it's infinitely better than it was, but is it is it really good enough? Is this really enough space for three hippos? I mean, the fact that their uh, polar bear, I don't know how many they have, but at least one of their polar bears is exhibiting signs of zoocosis. Um, this, I mean, it's so rampant uh, among animals in zoos that it actually has a name. It's called zoocosis when they exhibit these um, uh, neurological uh, disorders, signs of, of boredom and, and confinement where, uh, like you can see here, this is footage that I found uh, taken at the Memphis Zoo, apparently at their, I think it's called a Northwest Passage uh, from just a few months ago, sometime last year. Like I said, I saw it for myself at that exhibit. The exhibit is not old. It is, uh, I believe it was open to the public in 2006. I went to it maybe a few years after it had opened, and that was actually the last time that I ever went to the zoo. I saw the polar bear doing something similar to this. He was in the, the water, uh, or she, I don't know, was in the water and doing this kind of rocking motion, and it just 
I, I didn't know what it was at the time, but it, it looked wrong and it made me just really sad, really uncomfortable. So the fact that they have a, a relatively new exhibit, an exhibit, exhibit that's only a decade old, and they have animals in that exhibit um, exhibiting uh, obvious signs of psychosis, it doesn't exactly make me confident in their ability to provide enough room and entertainment for their animals. And again, this is considered one of the best zoos in the country. It consistently ranks in the top five. Another example of zoos valuing profits over uh, animal welfare would be white tigers. Uh, not just white tigers, also I believe they're called king cheetahs and uh, white alligators. White tigers are actually created through inbreeding, and so inevitably you end up with terrible, terrible deformities. Now fortunately, to be part of the association, or to be accredited, I guess, they cannot breed white tigers. So that has been phased out, so that's good. But again, there are still many, many other problems. Um, the biggest would just be with, you know, confinement and boredom. And I guess we can look at the extremes. I would say you have like elephants on one extreme and clownfish on the other. So clownfish are really interesting in that they rarely ever leave the uh, anemone, their host anemone, I guess. Apparently they rarely ever stray more than a few yards for, from their anemone. So you can think about a clownfish as like on the one extreme as far as not needing very much room. On the other string, we could probably think of something like elephants, a really, really large creature. I mean, elephants are like 20 feet long. A clownfish is what, like three inches. Elephants need a lot of room. When there's food scarcity, they can travel like 50 miles a day. When there isn't, they even still, they travel apparently like a few miles a day. To be clear, just because they do walk several miles a day doesn't mean that they necessarily want to, but I think it's, it's safe to say that they probably do want at least some of that, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of dangerous to anthropomorphize, but in situations where we just don't know, we kind of have to, right? I mean, what else can we do? And when it's situations like this, where we are trying our best to do what is best for the animal and to not be exploitative, right? To not give money to businesses who are ultimately going to harm animals. We do have to be more careful. And I think we do kind of have to ask, well, would I like that? There's also entertainment, which uh, a lot of zoos seem to be incorporating more and more, lots of different um, things that animals can do without expanding the space, which is obviously very, very expensive. And that's obviously an improvement, giving them something to do instead of just laying in a cage essentially all day. But it's not really clear how much this compensates for the lack of space, right? It's like what I talked about in the, the cat video that I did. It's not really clear, you know, we can put up cat runs and have lots of toys and stuff, but it's not really clear um, how well that compensates for just them being able to go out and roam. Now, a lot of people will argue that zoos do a lot of good through like conservation efforts, either through uh, raising money for conservation, so some of the ticket you know, price, the money that they get from that going to conservation efforts, or by uh, raising you know endangered species and then uh, releasing them back into the wild. VeganSociety.com has a good article on it, um, just noting that very little of the money actually goes to uh, conservation efforts. Plus, 90% of species encaged by European zoos are not threatened from extinction. Over 90% of zoo animals are born in captivity. These animals are then paired across zoos to ensure genetic diversity. Gender cannot be predicted and genes are sometimes overrepresented, leading to what zoos call a surplus of animals. 3,000 to 5,000 of these animals in European zoos are killed each year. In 2014, Copenhagen Zoo famously killed four lions and a giraffe. The four lions including two young lions, were killed to make way for a new male. The giraffe was killed because she could not produce any more young. They also note that for species that are actually threatened, like uh, pandas, that breeding campaigns rarely work. 400 pandas have been bred by zoos, yet only five have been released into the wild, and only three of those survived. Another problem that we have to be aware of, something that a lot of people experience when they see uh, a an animal or a person in really deplorable conditions, you know, we would expect people to feel, oh my God, I feel so sorry for them. I want to help them and feel like overwhelming compassion. But often what people experience is disgust. They feel like, oh my God, I need to get away from that. And they start to see the animal or again, or the human as the other. So that is something to be aware of. If you are 
wanting to take your kids to a zoo and there are exhibits like that again like the hippo exhibit that i described that's disgusting they're in this disgusting water you can see like the shit in the water right like is that really something that you think is going to instill compassion in your child? There's a good chance it won't. And this is where I would like to say farm sanctuaries are the answer. Unfortunately, most farm sanctuaries are nonprofit and they are not very open to having people come to visit them. I just looked at several uh, near where we are and none of them are open to the public. One is, but it's uh, like appointment only. All the others, they're looking for volunteers, which is, is great, but if you're already going to volunteer, you're probably already convinced that farm animals need help, right? You're probably already convinced, you're probably already vegan, right? Or at least vegetarian. This isn't really appealing to the masses. Like the masses don't want to go and do work. They want to go and experience a fun thing and look at some cute animals. I guess my point is that I think a lot of these farm sanctuaries are missing a really big opportunity. It costs so much money to care for these animals and it's really nice what they're doing, but they could be reaching so many more people and doing so much more good and helping so many more animals if they allowed more people to come and visit and to actually see these animals. Because we know that this is one of the most important things. We know that a lot of people credit their dogs and their cats with going vegetarian, with giving up meat, having a relationship with these animals. I mean, I can't imagine if more people could form relationships with the actual animals they're eating, with cows and pigs and chickens, that could just be incredible. This actually reminds me of an article from uh, the vegan strategist, uh, Tobias. Uh, it's called, Is This Big Zoo Better for Animals Than the Wild? And he talks about going to South Africa and going to uh, what was called a safari, but he um, he soon learned it was it was kind of a mix between a zoo and, uh, and a sanctuary. They had ample space and not all animals could easily be found, but they obviously couldn't leave the area because of fences. There was a vet on the property providing medical care when an animal got sick. Herbivores and carnivores were separate the lions could not hunt the springbok, for instance, but were fed cow's meat and antelope meat once a week. This is not the wild, and I'm sure many people would not feel entirely happy with such a situation. They would probably prefer an environment for the animals in which they had full autonomy and life was as close to natural as possible. I think that an important or the most important question here is, what would the animals prefer? This big zoo slash sanctuary or the wild? I believe that if we answer the latter, we might inadvertently be thinking in an anthropocentric way. There might be less autonomy for sure, but on the other side, there seemed at first sight to be less suffering. And I guess I'll leave it there. You know, I, I wish more farm sanctuaries would open to the public. Um, as far as me personally and zoos, you know, I again, I don't go to zoos. I haven't been to a zoo in a long, long time. It's not like you can choose, well, we're just gonna go look at the clownfish and we're gonna pay the money for the ticket and that money's just gonna go to the clownfish, right? Like you can't really do that if you're paying the ticket. It's going for all of it. It's going for the clownfish and it's going for the elephants. So I guess that's it. And you probably noticed I didn't mention anything like what happened to Harambe and what's happened to countless other you know animals in zoos as far as um, interaction with, with humans. I, I wanted to kind of stick to the, I guess the inherent problems of zoos. So even if those instances, like what happened to Harambe, even if that didn't happen, um, even still there are just so many problems with zoos. It's, it's the same with animal agriculture. Even if we didn't have uh, workers, you know, throwing chicken and just being um, overly cruel to farm animals, the inherent conditions themselves are just so terrible. You know, the, the tight living quarters and the filth and, and everything else, the debeaking and whatnot. Anyway, that was a little bit depressing, but uh, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video nonetheless. Any uh, comments or questions, of course, leave those in the comment section. And if you want to subscri sub uh, subscribe, that's it. You can uh, do that, obviously. And if you want to support the channel, you can do so at patreon.com slash unnaturalvegan. And thank you so much to the people uh, supporting this channel. Channel, God, I can't speak ever. Uh, it's super, super awesome. And super special thank you to these patrons, Alec Larson, Ali Perception Trainers, H.S. Ross, Isidro, James Baker, and Jody Lucas. Uh, yeah, thanks everybody. And I will have a new video hopefully soon. Oh, and I'm just remembering that I said last week that I jinxed myself because I said hopefully soon and then it was like going to be two weeks and it wasn't two weeks. I'm really proud of myself. <laughs>